This time it's five superbikes of the 70s with four cylinder motors. The 70s was very much the dawn of the superbike era. There had been superbikes before that, but not in such great in numbers. And there was a massive choice for the average rider if he wanted to purchase a superbike. And while four cylinder bikes had been the purview of racers and the very rich in the 1960s, by the 1970s they were very commonplace. So here are five of the best four cylinder superbikes of the early 70s. The Honda CB750 For many the Honda name is synonymous with four cylinder motorbikes, particularly their four cylinder 500cc Grand Prix racer of the late 60s, made famous of course by Mike Aylwood. However by the end of the 60s Honda were withdrawn from Grand Prix racing. They developed their cars and of course their all new four cylinder 750 superbike. Although in many ways a groundbreaking motorcycle, Honda were fairly conservative with the design of the 750, just using a single overhead cam and of course dry sub lubrication then pretty much standard at the time. And the styling was pretty conservative too, but this had been a smart move. The more daring styling of Triumph and BSA's three cylinder bikes had split opinions and more importantly had not gone down at all well in that all important American market. But Honda's 4 embraced modernity in all the right areas. There was of course directional indicators, electric start, there was disc brake at the front, although admittedly this wasn't great in wet weather, and of course there was those four exhausts, the real standout feature of the design when you look at it today. And this was indeed a very smart piece of styling because it told everybody you were riding something special. The motor was of course an air-cooled mill of 736 cc's, Honda would claim an impressive 67 horsepower at 8,000 rpm, although in truth at the back wheel it was rather less than that, only around 56. Top speed was claimed to be 123, but in reality you would be lucky to see that. But what was impressive about the bike was its smoothness and refinement, a cut above pretty much everything else available on the market at the time. The bike weighed in at 506 pounds, or 230 kilos wet. This actually isn't a bad figure, I don't think, for a four-cylinder bike of the period. Although the handling of the bike wasn't exactly the best, it was all a bit bouncy. But then this was, by the standards of 1969, a very large machine indeed. But of course the world does move on, and the Honda was very quickly surpassed by the Kawasaki's mighty Z1. But of course by the 1970s, Honda were investing very heavily in car production, so they didn't really have the budget to develop a completely new bike to replace it. So the Honda would have to make do with fairly minor updates during the 1970s, and this would be the introduction of the F2 with restyling, a little bit less weight and a touch more power. Although the bike would go on right until the end of the 1970s and the introduction of the dual overhead cam CB750 and CB900 models. The Suzuki GS750 The Suzuki GS750 can probably be regarded as a superbike that helps save Suzuki because Suzuki, like most of their Japanese competitors in reality, had invested heavily on the production of rotary engines. However, they were the only ones to actually go into full-fledged production, all the others having withdrawn. And so, unlike their Japanese competitors, Suzuki went all in. They built a purpose-built factory just to produce the RE5 rotary bike. And the RE5, of course, as we all know, was a complete failure and would leave Suzuki in dire financial straits because Suzuki had otherwise invested very heavily in two-strake technology and in the admission conscious world of the 1970s this would be a problem. Fortunately for Suzuki they did have a plan B and this was the GS750. Now of course the GS is heavily influenced by the Kawasaki Z1 and in fact the engines do look quite similar in many ways. And this is of course no bad thing because the Suzuki is well known for its over-engineered design and is a very robust motor. With Suzuki's dodgy regulator rectify setup, the only blot on an otherwise perfect machine. Because Suzuki had learned valuable lessons from their Japanese competitors, the bike arrived with twin disc brakes at the front to give superior braking, and the chassis was a considerable improvement over previous Japanese motorcycles. Although it was a little bit vague, it certainly had the best ride of any Japanese bike at the time, and was the only one that could live with European competition. The engine was a four-cylinder dual overhead cam unit with two valves per cylinder, five speeds 
and was said to produce around 70 horsepower at the crank. And so popular was the GS750 that Suzuki would create a smaller 550 alongside it, and then later a 1000cc Model 2. Both these machines would prove successful, and would carry Suzuki to the end of the 1970s. The MV Augusta 750S. Surtees, Hocking, Halewood, Agostini and Reed are just a few of the names that are associated with MV Augusta, a company synonymous with Grand Prix success, and one that can lay claim to 37 Grand Prix World Championships. So it would seem a natural progression for MV to produce a road going version of their mighty machines, right? Well, Count Domenico Augusto wasn't so convinced because he didn't like the idea of his works bikes being in competition with somebody on a customer machine, if you like. However, he was eventually persuaded to build a road-going multi. But he wasn't going to make it quite that easy. By the 1960s, of course, MVs were running three-cylinder racing bikes. So the Count decided to tell his engineers to build something that was based on the old four-cylinder bikes from the 50s and early 60s. And the bike should run shaft final drive to make it harder to convert into a racer. The result was a 600cc Tourer, which was, let's put it frankly, aesthetically challenged. And not surprisingly, a rather revvy, gawky looking 600cc machine was not what the general public had in mind. So the engineers went back to the drawing board, and in 1973 they came up with the 750S. And although still shaft drive, although a chain drive conversion would be available later, this was very much more what the public had in mind. The engine was a 743cc air cooled four cylinder with dual overhead cams. An MV would claim a peak power of 65 horsepower. Despite this, top speed was only measured at around 115 miles an hour, so actually slower than a Triumph Trident, or of course Honda's CB750. But of course the chassis was race based and was streets ahead of the Honda, meaning that the 506 pound or 230 kilo bike handled like nothing Japan had ever dreamed of building. The bike ran twin disc brakes at the front and the suspension was excellent. But unfortunately the machine was hugely expensive, frankly out of the price range of most riders. And there were still build quality issues, even at this price. And so ultimately, few were actually sold. And a large version called the America was sold with an 820cc engine towards the end of production. But with the two-stroke invasion well and truly underway in Grand Prix, MV's time at the top was all over. And by the end of the 70s, the company had gone bankrupt. The Kawasaki Z1. There's no doubt about it, but in 1973, when Kawasaki released the Z1, they completely wrong footed Honda and indeed the rest of the motorcycling world. It was their all new four cylinder four stroke completely leapfrogged the 750 class because it was 903 cc's. There was also dual overhead cam, wet sump lubrication, five speed gears, and of course electric start. But it was the claimed horsepower figure that everybody noticed. 82 horsepower put it 15 horsepower clear of Honda's 750. And while it's true that, that figure was at the crank rather than at the back wheel, the machine was still capable of it at 130 miles an hour. Now development of the machine had started way back in 68, in fact even earlier, but as a 750, under the project code name New York Stake, which gives you some idea of the market the bike was after. Which of course goes some way to explain the Kawasaki Z1 slightly raised bars on the first production models. Probably not the best sitting position if you're trying to break 130 I don't think. And that riding position, the chassis design and the all-up weight of 542 pounds or 246 kilos conspired to make a machine that was not the most nimble on the road. And in standard trim for some reason the bike only had a single disc at the front. But the engine was a brutal masterpiece, unkillable and very tunable, making it one of the most popular choices for drag racers during the 1970s. The Honda GL1000 Goldwing Now when Honda's Goldwing was launched in 1975, there was absolutely no doubt what market they were going for. And this is clearly demonstrated by the fact that later production would be taken on in the United States itself. Now, of course Harley Davidson had been building cruisers designed to carry you across America for many years. But these bikes were a generation or two behind the Goldwing, which boasted a liquid-cooled, single overhead cam, four-cylinder 1000cc motor. Another clever part of the design was the fact that the fuel tank was actually under the seat, a little bit like an aerial leader. And this was done, of course, to keep the weight down low. And what weight there was, 638 pounds of 290 kilos, was an incredible figure during the 1970s. 
However, even with all that weight, and the fact that the bike had zero aerodynamics, the shaft drive machine still produced 80 horsepower and could claim a top speed of around 122 miles an hour. There's no doubt the machine was not only aimed at Harley Davidson, but also at the shaft drive bikes from Europe, from BMW and Goodsey, but it did everything to extremes and excess. And perhaps for that reason alone, the machine quickly gathered a cult following, and one that is still with us today. And one that's been reinforced by the machine's slow movement into a class of its own as it developed through 1100, then 1200, through to the fully fed six cylinder monsters that we have today. Now, my own experience with Goldwings is in fact with this early one litre machine, and even at that size, it was pretty darn big and heavy. You didn't really notice this while riding, but when you had to do slow manoeuvres, you were very conscious of all that weight. But that said, it was comfortable, and the motor boasted more than enough torque than any normal person would ever actually need. And in many ways, it's not surprising to see why the bike does develop that cult following. It's individualistic and it's very capable. And surprisingly nimble for the twisties for its size, the bike handles better than it has any right to. Okay, so it was no Norton Featherbed, but then it was never intended to be, was it? One of the collections of bikes would you like to see us do a video on? Maybe you have a bike we can use for a test ride. Either way, get in touch. Hope you enjoyed that video, if you did, don't forget to like and subscribe and of course, thank you very much for watching.